Welcome to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, Editor-in-Chief of Southern Living Magazine. Today's guest has been making some friends in the kitchen during quarantine, getting acquainted with his air fryer, his pressure cooker, and his Instant Pot. The Instant Pot is amazing. We cook chicken noodle soup, elk chili, so it's definitely one of my favorites. And it's in like half an hour, and it's so juicy, it's so good. John Party is a native of Dixon, California, a farming town near Sacramento, but his style of country music revels in the old school charm of Nashville. Since his breakout year in 2017, when he took home ACM and CMA awards for Best New Male Vocalist and Best New Artist, John has been making his mark as a modern country outlaw. He has an irreverent new digital variety show called Party Time with CMT about life on his Tennessee farm. And his new album, Heartache Medication, is a tribute to whiskey, honky-tonks, and legends like Willie, Waylon, and Merle. On today's program, John tells us that if country music weren't on the table, the hard labor he learned as a teenager would certainly keep him employed. I can weld, I can drive big equipment, I can fix fences, I can run a ranch I want to. You just did that with your father, you did that with your your friend's dad, you, you know, you just were helping out and you didn't know that you were learning stuff at the time, but you were just doing it. Plus the influence John's grandmother had on his career and more on Biscuits and Jam. Well, uh, John Party, welcome to Biscuits and Jam. Biscuits and Jam. Glad to be here. Well, I want to start by asking you a little bit about California. You grew up in a little town called Dixon. Tell me a little bit about life in Dixon when you were a kid. Well, life in Dixon was growing up around farmland and living in a small town and working with my dad, going to school, wanting to sing music, country music. Tom Petty, rock and roll. San Francisco was probably an hour, 45 minutes away, and they had Sacramento 45 minutes away. We could go to the big city life, but Dixon was just a quiet little town, and it's kind of grew into commuter town now, but back before we, we left, it was still kind of small town Dixon. And this is really farm country. Oh, yeah. You can farm anything out there. I mean, from hay to tomatoes to watermelons are out there. You got almonds olives, grapes, I mean, anything. I didn't think there was cotton in California. I know cotton farmers now. <laughs> and it's just, you can kind of grow everything out there because you have so much control of the water and you always got sunshine. And when I say control the water, that, you know, that water is sacred. It's sacred out in California. So it's all recycled in reservoirs and they're always running through it. So it, they got a good system. So what did your parents do for a living? My dad was in heavy equipment land leveling, and my mom worked at UC Davis for a little bit and then kind of stayed home to take care of us and was like team mom for all my football. So what were some jobs that you had as a teenager? Were you working for your dad at all? I, I worked for my dad every chance I got. Worked at grocery stores. That one didn't last long. That was a little <laughs> too boring for me. Longest job I had in high school, I was at a Ford dealership out there. I was shuttle guy. I was washing the cars. Like from 15 on, I was working for an AC company that we'd go and put ACs in houses and where you can get a work permit and learn how to do that. And, and then 18, I went and worked with my dad. And then at 22, I left for Nashville. But I was playing music all in between these jobs. So and that's why this job never lasted. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, who was the cook in your family? My mom. My mom was definitely the cook. But my dad's also a really good cook, too. So it was my mom and my dad. So did you have some favorites that they made when you were growing up? Oh, I still do. Um Basically, my mom's food, she likes to use a lot of butter. I try to get her out of that. Like, you know, you don't have to use so much butter these days, but she's just got her recipes. Uh, her chicken enchiladas are good. Chicken and dumplings are good. She always made good tacos. Uh, my dad, he makes great elk tacos. I mean, I, we make elk tacos a lot, but he makes the best elk tacos. And he's really good at cooking steaks. Are these elk that you and your dad harvested? Yes, we, we go elk hunting every year. We love the spot and stock and the challenge of elk hunting. And we also love the way it tastes. And it's probably the best that you can hunt in the U.S., I think, in elk, is, is elk and, and what you get to eat. It's just great. There's so many good recipes. 
It's awesome. Yeah, I've had it. I love it. And and if you get one, you're going to have some meat for a long time. My freezer is full. I got, I'm just like giving elk meat away. You want some? <laughs> So, John, what about the holidays? Was that a big thing in your family growing up? Yeah. When I was a kid, of course, we loved Christmas as kids. Couldn't wait. We'd always get up at like 4.30 in the morning, make everybody mad, you know, and have to go back to bed. Thanksgiving was always fun. My dad's side of the family is big farmers, and so we'd go out to their big shop out there and eat, have Thanksgiving and stuff. And then it turned into, you know, going to... to my house for Christmas or going to my mom's house for Christmas. And that's been a lot of fun. And so my dad's been coming out here for Christmas the past couple of years. And we have a lot of fun. We get a lot of work done. We cook and eat, have a great time. And then of course we go to Northern California where my mom's at and we'll have a great Christmas out there. See all my cousins. I have so many cousins and a lot of family. So I do miss them and it's good to go out there and see them and, uh, so it's it's a lot more adventurous. Let's put it now. The, the newer uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas is like adventure, <laughs> whereas <laughs> when you're younger, you just kind of go where you're told to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, I've read that your grandmother was a big influence on you in terms of music. Can you tell me a little bit about her? Her name was Loretta. I thought it was cool. You know, you never know it, but like when you hear Beatles "Get Back," it's like "Get Back, Loretta." <laughs> it's like little stuff. So. My grandmother loved country music. That's all she listened to. So when I was a little kid, that's all we listened to. And we sang probably from age two on. We were always singing. She'd kind of sing to me. I'd sing back. Of course, I didn't know what I was doing. And it just kept growing, going into this thing to where we'd sing karaoke together. And my grandma was not like a great singer. She just loved to sing and entertain. She was just one of the, those people that just sang because they loved it and I just kind of caught on from that and just listening to the great music that she would play me from Merle Haggard to Randy Travis, a bunch of George Strait, Alan Jackson. She loved Alan Jackson, loved Brooks and Dunn. She just loved great country music. And I kind of grew up listening to that. And I remember when I was trying to write songs and she'd try to help me, she'd listen, you know, just being a, like a good grandmother. And it just kind of helped me always have a way to be like, yeah, do that. You should do that. You should do like George does. You should do like Alan does. When you're a little kid, you don't know what you're doing. So I still don't know. And we still don't know what we're doing. But we got a good, you know, grasp on it. And and from learning to play guitar at nine and exploring music without knowing you're exploring it, I guess if that makes sense. Like I'm just having fun playing music. And I guess that's just kind of stuck with me and, and it still does now. But She's definitely the one that put that uh, music in my ear. And, and I don't have any other family members that play music. I'm the only one that plays music. I'm the only one that sings in my family. Um, I take that back. I do have a cousin, Colleen San Luis Obispo. She does play the bass and sings and stuff, too, which she's really – and she's a fantastic painter. So I do have one artistic person in my family. But my grandmother was never really – known as an artistic person more of just like karaoke singer and love country music so it kind of worked out you know john you mentioned merle haggard and he was born in california i wonder if you had a special connection with merle because of his california roots always you know i love being in a state where merle haggard was you know he put his claim on it and i put my claim on it. it's just you know it's different now. It's uh, music's everywhere. Whereas then it was like, you know, he worked so hard to bring his music to branch out and worked really hard enough to where, you know, I mean, it's hell. He saw Johnny Cash in prison, you know, <laughs> like, like crazy stories like that. And then going down to Bakersfield and it's just way different these days. Like I'd love to be able to hang in California and be a part of Nashville, but it's not, that's just not how it is. Dwight Yoakam, you know, he's, he was born in Kentucky, but I had this conversation with Dwight. They're like, man, you just can't, you wouldn't be able to do what you can do in Nashville and California. So it's hard for me because I want to be like, yeah, I'm in California, <laughs> but I'm not. Um, but I'm born there. I go back all the time. I'm family there. I love that state. And, you know, I feel like that's one of our bigger audiences. And, and I always take claim in it because I want to be known from California also because of Buck, Merle, and Dwight state claim in there. We got Gary Allen. He's from California. He's out here too. 
And I got Brett Young now, Tyler Rich. Cam's come, the California crew, and Devin Dawson. And so it's kind of grown into this thing to where we're all kind of doing our things. And we're kind of in and out of California. But we, like, support and love our, our heritage of, of California country. John, was there an early performance that you remember where you started to realize that this music thing might be more than just a hobby? I think... When we turned into like a real life thing, it was definitely at 18, I realized I wanted to do it full time, wanted to play music. And I just wasn't mature enough, you know, like it's hard to just go out on your own at 18 and be like, I'm going to go to Nashville. I've never been anywhere out of Dixon. It was hard for me, especially, you know, parents getting fresh and divorced and not really knowing what the hell I'm going to do. So headed up to Chico, California and tried to junior college out there. And Butte College, a great school. Chico's a great school, but it's also a great party school. And I ended up starting a college country band out there called Northern Comfort. And I toured around Northern California for about three or four years, playing all the dive bars and just having fun. We had played some fairs. And I started writing. I was writing a lot of the songs that people were requesting and buying our CDs. And like, I still, to this day, I'll get requests for a Northern Comfort song. And I think that's when it really kind of set in that I could do this. I could, I could move to Nashville. I could write melodies. I can write songs that people actually want to hear. And I believed in myself enough. I was Mr. Confidence. I didn't care. I was like, I'll show me. I'm California. I'm country. You know, <laughs> like, I just had that, that edge to me and I still do. So it just kind of helped having that and having the experience of playing all the bars. And, and basically I, I went to Nashville a couple of times when I was about 18 and about 20 and I realized that I should at le- least go when I'm 22 and I, I uh, can drink. Because it's a lot easier to play bars when you're over 21. I never thought, like, I'm going to move to Nashville and become so the biggest country star. I never really thought that. I was like, I'm just going to move to Nashville and kind of figure out that and figure out songwriting. I never really said I was like, I'm going to go there and try the country music thing. So it sounds like you had a kind of rough time around the age of 18. And I wonder if some of that toughness served you well moving to Nashville and trying to make it as a country star. Yeah, well, I I get a lot of tough from my father. And I always give Dixon a big shout out for when it comes to tough and hard working, because that's what they were. That's what my dad's friends were. They were the blue collar rednecks that go to work every day. And they have a lot of skills that not many people have anymore. Like I can weld, I can drive big equipment, I can fix fences, I can run a ranch I want to. You just did that with your father. You did that with your your friend's dad. You, you know, you just were helping out, and you didn't know that you were learning stuff at the time, but you were just doing it. And I learned so much from being from Northern California, and I, I always love that. And the part where I'm from, I always give them credit. Of that's where I get the toughness from, of uh, the kind of Western attitude, straight talking, very kind of cowboyish. Well, you've been in the South for a long time now. You've been in Nashville for a while. I'm wondering how the South is treating you these days? I've been in Nashville for 12 years. and I love Nashville. I always say I grew up in Nashville. The 22-year-old didn't know nothing coming to the South. You know, I had a PA system, a dog, a couple guitars, and an album that I recorded in Chico, California. And I was coming after Nashville. And if you would ask me at that time of 22 what I thought was a great restaurant, I would have told you Olive Garden. But I just didn't know. I was just, I was a kid from Dixon, man. Like we, I didn't see a lot. I didn't go high rise dining in San Francisco. We we're very small, kind of country people. So going to Nashville was like my first big experience being in a city, going to bars, meeting people at publishing companies, and and, and kind of going around. But it's not really a huge city either, which makes Nashville so special. Was there one artist in particular who really? gave you a hand up in your early days? Well, I definitely Dirk Bentley and Luke Bryan and Eric Church took me out on tour in the early years. Justin Moore took me out on there. So many people at Losers Bar and Grill helped me out. I played there from like 2009 to, uh, you know, 10 and, and always in and out of Losers and 
Is that still one of your favorite places? Still one of my favorite places. I, I, it's tough to go in there because once you go in there, it's hard getting out of there. Uh, or And if you, you don't remember when you get out of there, but it's a good time and it's just kind of been my spot that I got to call home. Or, you know, everybody kind of artist has their kind of home bar that you can use to, you know, get drunk and get all crazy or sing songs back in the day i think it's kind of cool to have that home spot yeah like you put my claim like yeah i used to run back here a lot you know we'll continue with john party after the break welcome back to biscuits and jam from southern living i'm sid evans and we're talking with john party well, John, I know you love the Ryman. You proposed to your fiance Summer during a show at the Ryman last year. Tell me a little bit about how that came together. Well, I met Summer through my mom. Summer does hair, and my mom's friend was getting her hair done by Summer, and Summer was just kind of single. She was kind of over the dating thing. and The word was that she mentioned to Summer that she knew somebody who was tall, and that's how it kind of started. That's what, that's what they <laughs> tell me. But anyway, I'm glad I met Summer like that, and and we started dating, and then you just kind of know we get along really well, and we understand each other, and uh, she's definitely learned her fair share of the music business and dealing how to be with an artist and and all that stuff. There's a whole lot to learn with that, and so I didn't know where to propose, but I thought the Ryman, we had two sold-out shows at the Ryman, and like the Ryman's such a magical place, it's got a lot of spirit there, you know, and it's just a country church, and I always love playing there, I love going there, and it's it's like, what other cool spot would it be to ask my girlfriend to marry me in, in front of everybody, and I just thought that would be special. And we had all the camera guys there, so I already, you know, didn't have, didn't have to hire another separate camera crew to go to some remote location. It just worked out really good and it's really memorable and we we loved it and we're finally finally coming around next month to get married. That's great. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So, I want to ask you about your new album called Heartache Medication. So, the album was released last fall before the days of COVID-19, but you said that the whole album was meant to make people feel better. And I'm just wondering if that has resonated with fans even more than you thought. Um, I hope so. It's a tough year for all of us. And, and I think Heartic Medication has all kinds of feel good in there and some sad stuff to, to make you feel good. At, like the song called Starlight, I kind of based around my grandma. Starlight was written in 2014, believe it or not. It was about my, my grandmother and uh, friends that I've lost that, you know, you can kind of sense they're still around their sense they're helping you out some way some power and i feel like starlight c- could mean even more now these days where you don't know what's happening and kind of lean towards the spiritual side or you know you lean towards somebody you miss you can kind of think about them in, in a in a fun way a happy way not in a really sad way i love that record i love making it and uh, we're currently getting songs together for the fourth record. I don't even know when the hell that thing's going to come out, but um, uh, we're working on it. It's taking our time, though. Well, I wanted to ask you with Starlight if you would mind just singing a little bit of that, but just a verse or so. It's a little higher up, but... I've been blessed and I have sinned Where the scars are where I've been Lucky to be alive and breathe And there's been night air I swear you're right here, get the chills on my skin, and that's when I get this feeling. You're shining down on me, showing me the way, angel in the night, here to save the day, like a light out of the dark, straight across the sky, up there in that starlight, starlight tonight. So listen, I want to hear about your new show that you started called Party Time. It looks like you had a little time on your hands and uh, decided to have some fun. Yeah, we did the off the road for the CMT and they kind of came back like, hey, would you want to do, you know, some episodes of hanging around the house? Because I can be fun, funny, and and we've got a lot of action out here. And so, yeah, we kind of came up with the whole list of things to do. 
and it's been fun to watch the episode. And of course, they're not crazy long, so it's not like you need, you know, we're going to need 45 minutes of stuff. So it makes it nice. That's about the attention span these days of, uh, you know, just flipping through socials. <laughs> you can go about 10 minutes. Um, but it's been fun. Summer is a great cook, so that's been a fun thing to do with the show is have we have our own little cooking stuff and it kind of gives a normalcy to 2020 for everybody that watches it i think it gives a little bit of uh an intimate look to my life and and just how i like to have a good time and, and still manage to be functional and it, every episode always makes me laugh so i hope it makes everybody else laugh <laughs> well it seems like you've got some skills with that instant pot we got an air fryer and a pressure cooker but the instant pot is amazing we cook Chicken noodle soup, elk chili, so it's definitely one of my favorites. And it's in like half an hour, and it's so juicy. It's so good. Well, John, you know, I know you were going 100 miles an hour before all this hit, and you were touring all over the country and playing sold-out shows everywhere. What have the last few months been like for you in general? It's been great time at home. It's been... Fun with friends, seeing a lot more artists than we, we ever have because we're not on the road. We all want to see each other. But I've been getting by, you know. I feel like I'm going 100 miles per hour around my house now, not in the country. Setting up lights and getting this computer ready and getting these phones ready and writing songs and knocking down trees and fixing fences, dreaming. Still dreaming. Still got dreaming, you know. You can't can't get rid of dreaming. But um, it's been a crappy year. And it's been a challenging year for all of us. It's been a challenging year for the world. And I feel like we're all sitting on go just to be back to cross that line right back to normal. And I hope we get to cross that line soon. You know, I can't sit and think about the negative why I can just be at home and, and think about the positives. And I'm blessed for that. What are you looking forward to the most when we get on the other side of this? I'm looking forward to that feeling that we never known before. And that is... I'll never moan about another show I don't want to play or showing up for or meet and greet. And I, I feel like that first concert we play is going to be the same for the crowd. I think people are going to cry. I think people are just going to be so just in awe that they're back to normal. And uh, I can't wait for that. Well, me too. And uh, John Party, thank you so much for being on Biscuits and Jam. Biscuits and Jam, baby. <laughs> Thanks for listening to my conversation with John Party. You can catch his digital variety series, Party Time, on CMT's social media. And his latest album, Heartache Medication, is available wherever you get music. Southern Living is based in Birmingham, Alabama. And this podcast was produced and edited in Nashville, Tennessee. If you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or telling your friends about the program. You can find us online at southernliving.com and subscribe to our print publication by searching for Southern Living at www.magazine.store. Biscuits and Jam is produced by Heather Morgan Schott, Chrissy Tiglius, and me, Sid Evans, for Southern Living. Thanks also to Ann Kane, Jim Hankey, Eliza Lambert, and Rachel King at Pod People. I'll see you here next time for more Biscuits and Jam. <laughs>